Hello and welcome to the second stage of the 2019 Hyundai Archery World Cup. We're here in Shanghai in Yuancheng Stadium and eliminations are proceeding just behind us. I'm Chris and I'm here with US Archer Braden Gelantine. How are you yes, doing? Chris, Braden? doing great. Thank you for having me. Nice. Excited to be here. Thank you very much for coming and joining us. Um, we've got questions for Braden coming up later. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, his last event in Medellin where Braden finished second and some things that have happened over his career. And we're also going to kick off by talking about what's happening here in Shanghai. What's sure. going on so far, Braden? We shot qualification yesterday and headed into matches today. They've shot the first 124th. The others are currently going on now. And uh, yeah, we've got final matches coming tomorrow and then the finals on the weekend. Perfect stuff. Uh, how's your competition gone so far? I, I got in the morning of qualification. It went fairly well considering I ended up eighth for qualification and headed to matches tomorrow against uh, Tate Morgan first round. So it'd be fun to be American on American first round. Uh, why were you so late here in Medellin? Uh, we were shooting in, in Shanghai, yeah. We were in another event in uh, Redding, California. Uh, it's one of the major NFA events, so I was able to hop a plane in LA 1 a.m. and get in at 6 a.m. the next morning when we got here. So, missed uh, official practice, but feeling pretty good, ready to go. Uh, it's not a problem for you to come in so late and miss, miss it, the start of practice? It really wouldn't have been, but I got food poisoning on the fight, flight, so I was feeling a little sick yesterday. It was a battle getting through qualification, but I managed to earn one of the top eight protected slots so I was able to recover today have a nice easy practice and I'm feeling really strong going into tomorrow matches but time wise it's no different than we do at other events it's just land practice go to work I mean you've been here so many times anyway you, you were telling me you only missed one in Shanghai right yeah I missed the first year that we had it here and I've been at every other event so I feel really comfortable in the stadium I, I know you know the conditions on the wind you know versus the different areas of the stadium so I, I felt it feels like home almost how does the wind go in the stadium uh it's it's very confusing there were so many times yesterday where the wind on us was moving left to right but the flag was showing right to left and you have to remember you know that in that case you have you really have to trust the wind that's on your body more than anything else because it's going to be affecting the movement of the bow as the arrow goes off so the majority of your drift is what you feel on you also, anytime you get close to the entrance and the exits on the sides, there's a lot of wind funneling through that, so it makes for a really choppy aim and, you know, choppy arrow flight as well. So well, that, that circular wind movement's pretty typical in stadiums, right. right? Right, of course, yeah. It's anytime you're in a big dome-like area. And this is probably the most enclosed venue that we have. So it's, like you said, it's the most circular wind that we have in any, any arena that we shoot in. Have you enjoyed shooting in Shanghai over the years? Have you... Absolutely. The weather is normally beautiful. We had one year where it rained nonstop the entire time, but other than that, it's always been in the lower 80s, you know, like 30, 35 degrees. It's been gorgeous. Yesterday was probably the coldest I've, I've had here. Yeah? yeah it, was, it was comfortable to wear shorts and a hoodie. It kind of felt like home. It felt like spring shooting, so it was kind of nice. <laughs> um, you, you shot how many points for, for qualification? I shot 706, 306. 352, 354. Which isn't bad coming off a plane. No, I was really happy with the 706. I was... Uh, Looking at it, there weren't a lot of names here. A lot of the people opted to stay home and get ready for Turkey in two weeks. But uh, the quality of shooting was still right there. You're doing Turkey as well after this? Yes, I'll be at Turkey at the World Championships and then in, in Berlin as well. That's a busy run. That's uh, Medellin, week off, not even a week right. off because of Reading. And then... Yeah, it, I, I originally was going to have seven days at home between April and the end of June. I canceled a trip to an ASA, and so now I have about two weeks. So <laughs> uh, It's been nonstop going, but that's why we do it, right? Uh, we, we love it. We travel. Uh, it's a crazy life but it's my life so do you do your own laundry or just something else i i do uh, that's one of the major things that i have planned at home it's like i have an hour to do laundry in my 18 hours at home so <laughs> sleep for 10 and how, then how big is your washing machine oh man i've got one of the uh, industrial sizes and it's just kind of like entire suitcase in the washer and then yeah back in it goes that's my that's my that's my least favorite thing about traveling is the laundry yeah, yeah it's not fun <laughs> <laughs> and so you were you were talking to me earlier you were telling me that um you think the level has increased over all the years you've come to Shanghai and the game has changed in compound. What? Yeah, I think I think when I first started getting into archery, everybody was, you know, really focused fo focused and fixated on the perfect shot and having perfect form over and over again and that was how you attain groups. I think with the amount of knowledge, with form, with technique, with, you know, technological advances in equipment that the game is is changing incredibly. I think people are now it's so easy to shoot a 10 and it's so easy to duplicate that shot well enough that you can shoot 10 after 10 and I think a lot of people kind of sell their souls for that short-term gain in score days like yesterday in the first half I, I feel like even five years ago a lot of shooters have been content with the 348 you know 58 ends and just maintaining their form so they can fight another day but nowadays we have guys that really are looking for that short-term success so they're you know 
punching a thumb trigger or or you know shooting a little bit faster faster shots so that they can get through it and have you know that 355 score and it makes everyone else need to do that too so we're all kind of selling our souls for a back of lack of better terms uh, to, to get that short-term gain and because a lot of guys they don't have the travel schedule that I do so they're able to train for two or three weeks and get rid of any bad habits that spring up and they come out and they have that short-term burst of score whereas I'm doing that every weekend and it kind of does take a toll over time so to, to be sustainable how, how do you make that into a sustainable uh, and still perform at a high level it's to the point where you just need to get that much better I, I can't I can't have that you know that punch or that you know that trigger slap or whatever and then get that score because it just it would mess me up so much for the week to come so it's just I, I can't have an off day I can't have an off arrow I just need to work that much harder in practice when you told me um, earlier in the year that after last year you kind of took a look at yourself and, and to find that extra edge mm -hmm. and what, what have you been doing recently that's this, been different right this fall I spent a lot of time in the gym I, I bought a home gym I was you know running about four or five miles a day on the on the treadmill and I was lifting weights and, and really getting back to uh, back to a, a focus of being an athlete who shoots archery versus an archer who's kind of athletic mm -hmm. and that was amazing. It, it led to one of my best indoor seasons ever. I may not have I, I, you know, won Nîmes, I won Rome, mm -hmm. and I didn't have the success in Vegas. But uh, you know, I can't I can't win every event. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I really felt stronger. I felt more in tune with my body and, and my performances. It, it was really it was really nice to see a, a steadier aim. And, and the biggest thing that I noticed was I was aiming better longer into the shot. Okay. Uh, instead of my body breaking down and needing to recover, I felt like uh, the recovery time was a lot faster and, and my aim was a lot more steady. It's something that's kind of been difficult to keep up with the last month on the road, but I'm excited during this next little downturn to, to get back into that. Do you think it has translated into the outdoors yet, or do you think you need some more time to kind of reset that? I think I think I need a little bit more time to get back to it. I I did notice at the tail end of outdoor season last year when I really got on the health kick that I was I was aiming better, shooting stronger, mm -hmm. and I was I was definitely seeing increased performances. So right now I would say, in terms of physical fitness, I'm probably a three out of ten for myself and, and my standards. But um, in the next month, I'd like to be up for seven eight for the world championships. Kind of hit that on a on a peak. That's right. I'm a, I'm a minus one out of ten. So right. No worries. And <laughs> do you use the gym in the hotels when you're traveling? I haven't. I, I need to get into that. It's just it's at home. I have such a good routine and, and a standard. It's it's tough to it's tough for me personally to to find that with equipment that's not my own. It's I just it's an excuse, but it's not a good one. So creature of habits. Exactly. Um, obviously, the, this is a, a big year. World Championships coming up, and, and you have experience at the World Championships. Yes. And you've experienced at meddling at the World Championships. Right. Not a gold medal, but I've had a couple silvers and bronzes. Yeah. Uh, definitely one that I want for the uh, for the resume. Yeah. So, I'm excited. Uh, a lot of things would have to fall in my favor to win, just as anyone else. I just uh, I want to make sure that I go into that event with every controllable that I can, you know, I can I can muster. Just have everything aced. So of course everyone wants to win the world championships. Every, everyone's everyone's looking for that right on their resume. But being so close so many times and, and not quite making it mm -hmm. has that changed your your view of it? No, I still want it just as badly, and I try to really have a short-term memory when it comes to events. I know that I've had a lot of success there, so that I, I feel like I can handle it. I, I know that I have the confidence and the skill set and the, the ability to do well at the World Championships. So, uh, if anything, it just motivates me more to get the job done. Any of those that you did have past success at, do you think you could have or should have won any of them? Um, of, of course, anytime you get that close and don't win, you, you can think back and find critical moments that could have flipped the match in a different direction or just, you know, changed things a little bit. I, I know that in my career I've had a lot of success, but I've had a lot of third place victories. I feel like a lot of times I've gotten, gotten to the semifinal and allowed myself to take the foot off the gas a little bit. Like, all right, I've made it into the, you know, metal matches and kind of had an adrenaline dump before. I needed to. So I feel like a lot of times I've let up just a little bit and then obviously gone into the bronze match, gotten excited and, and done what I needed to do. So that's one thing that I've worked on recently is definitely keeping that pedal down, you know, staying focused and indoor season, it definitely worked in the matches. I was able to, you know, keep everything down, qualify in Rome, do the same in, in, uh, in Nimes as well. And going into the first outdoor world cup, I made it into the gold final. So it, it's, I just, I need to keep putting myself in contention, in position to do well. And I think things are going to work out favorably. 
So it's, it's quite interesting you say that. So you, you kind of, you know, we, we shoot the, the rounds after each other. So you do mm -hmm. the fourth round, the quarterfinals, the semifinals. Something changes when you win your quarterfinal match, when you're in that final four. Right. I, I noticed that. It was, it, it's really tough to reflect and look back on your successes and, and find weakness in yourself because we all, you know, train so hard for this. We like to think that we're giving it our, you know, our all, all the way. Or, you know, when, when you miss a point in a match in the last end, it's so easy to say, oh, well, it was my last arrow, but it would have missed. I would have missed it any time. It wasn't because it was my last arrow I made a bad shot. It's so easy to kind of push those fears aside or, you know, push those worries away and just say, oh, it just happened. Mm. But to actually dig deep and, and realize, you know, this is a weakness of mine. I need to address it. I need to get better. It, it was definitely a, an eye-opening moment for me to realize that, I was losing focus in that situation, and something needed to change. So, what have you changed? What what are you what are you doing differently? Right, I've 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 definitely I've stayed more aware of my emotions during matches. Uh, I've always not been the greatest opening match shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like the first match, I've got a lot of nerves. I, I feel like a lot of times I'm in a situation where I should win because of just seedings or rankings. I feel like I'm in a position where I have more to lose. So the first match is kind of nerve wracking for me in that regard. Whereas I, I just, I want to come out, I want to shoot well, but I'm afraid of losing. Once I get through that and I'm in the top 16, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. Like, mm -hmm. if I come in ninth, it's really not that big a deal. So I'm able to relax, I'm able to focus more on my shot technique and everything, and, and things roll a lot more smoothly. And again, when I, when I get to the eights, I'm like, all right, just one more match and I'm in. I'm in the show, like, that's what I want. And I'm normally able to just get there. And in the past, I've been in situations where once I get to that final four, it's kind of like, all right, job done. Yeah. Let me just shoot. And that release of, it, of adrenaline, that just that dump is enough to go from like the 148 and a half level to 147. And everybody who's there is a good shooter. Mm -hmm. it's, you don't make the final four by mistake. Yeah. So by losing that point and a half off my average, I was losing instead of winning and then going to the bronze match and then obviously getting hyped up and ready to go and back to my normal know level. <laughs> right, and nobody wants fourth, so I think a lot of times you see the score in the bronze match a little higher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So it, it was something that I just I needed to work mentally more than more than technically mm. and just stay focused, stay in it, and, and stay aggressive. It's funny, we were talking earlier about storylines in, in the sport and sharing the storylines. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me hearing you talk about that you know, we're talking about shooting arrows and shooting the same arrow over and over again. How many different variations there are in the mental storyline throughout the day? Right. It's there's so much going on, you know, between the ears and mm. these matches that that isn't visible. Mm. And I, I'm I would imagine I'm not the only one going through it. It's it's definitely a struggle week in week out to stay in it at the entire time. Mm. So you kind of want to di write a little diary, like you know, minute minute two, you know, a little right. bit of doubt stretches in and, and look back at it, but. I, sure. I guess it's quite hard to remember how you felt throughout that day as well. Oh, absolutely. And and by the time it's done, you feel so exhausted when, when it's a long day on the field because you've been so mentally focused and dialed in for so long that by the time it's over, it's just it's such a relief and, and exhaustion sets in. Mm. I remember the, the, the World Cup final in Rome where you, mm -hmm. you, shot, you shot exceptionally that entire weekend. Didn't yes. You? Uh, it was a 149 in the final, I think. I think 148. I missed my last arrow. Because I, I knew I needed gold to win, and it was just kind of like, it's in the 10 ring, it's in the 9 ring, it's okay, just shoot. <laughs> yeah. And then, so is, was that, that's a reasonable question to ask, was that, was that mental storyline different when everything worked and everything was on point for the entire... Right. I knew going into Rome that I was going to have a really good event. I had had some form breakthroughs in practice. Uh, I, I've, it's no, like, I'm not hiding this. I've struggled with target panic for mm. the last couple of years. It, for me, I, I have trouble executing a shot with the pin in the middle. Mm. It's... I, I think it's a fear of missing. It's a fear of hitting almost, too. Mm. Uh, and right before Rome, I, I was able to, to have that execution, and everything was just feeling great. So I knew it was going to be a good weekend for me. Once I got to the finals, I, Stefan had been shooting amazing, and I knew I needed a good score. So I was able to stay fairly relaxed under the circumstances. I mean, when you're shooting in the World Cup final for you know, all the money, it's, it's definitely stressful. Mm. And I was able to stay focused, and I, I'm pretty sure I dropped the first point in the match. And yeah. I remember walking back to my father and saying, all right, well, 149 is not bad, but let's get it done. And once, once somebody drops a point in the match, I feel like that's a turning point to see how the other person handles being, handles being ahead or you know, handles being behind. And, and things get shaken up. Luckily, Steph, for, luckily for me, Stefan had a, little, a few hiccups 
a pin dropped out the bottom a couple times on him, and I was able to capitalize and get the win. I love that you bring your parents to, to stand behind you sometimes. Right. I, I really I love having my parents there at events because my entire career they've been my biggest supporters, allowing me to do this, helping me uh, when I was younger, you know, attend events, and they really helped me get my kickstart. And I, I've got no better coach, better mentor than my father in those situations, and he... He enjoys it. I enjoy having him there. It's it's wonderful. Mm. Um, you talk about target panic and yeah. um, and and you said you struggled with it. What have you tried? I mean, I mean uh, we know what target panic is. It's just, sure. it's a difficult beast, and a lot of people have it. I mean, almost. I would say like it's really easy to win a few events when you're young and not have it, mm. and and anyone can win a couple. But to have a career, you have to learn to deal with it. You have to learn to handle it and embrace it. So so what is it that you have done to deal with it and sure. and kept? being at a, at a level I know you've had issues like right. even at events you, you, you've kind of I remember Antalya a couple of years ago you were just like that was not a good me that was a target panic me you right know? Uh, but you've come out of most of that I would say sure it's it's the kind of thing where it's easy to get caught up in it and continue shooting bad shots and get depressed and get angry and that's kind of what festers it and makes it worse uh, it's important when you go home and you're in practice to to go back immediately and shoot blank bail. Get the feeling back. And one thing that I do that I think really helps me is I shoot blank bail but on a target face. I'll draw back and I'll let the pin float in the 9 and the 8 ring and execute shots with that stimulus of the target face and become comfortable shooting shots without worrying about impact or or score. I've never heard that before. That's quite cool. So you're, you're blank bailing, but you can still see a target face. Exactly. You, so I become comfortable executing in the 9 ring and the 8 ring, and slowly I work towards the 10 ring. And, and it's just, I think that that's one thing that really helps me get over it more quickly mm. by by gaining confidence shooting 10s without meaning to in practice and just and just relating a 10 to the perfect shot versus a 10 to the side picture. That's quite interesting. So we were talking about active and passive aiming, whether sure. you, you force the pin in the middle or you kind of let it float. And you told me that, that active, uh, active aiming is compound now and passive aiming is kind of gone. Right. But what you're talking about is a Passive aiming and practice to get over yeah, the, yeah. the fear so that you can actively aim in a tournament. That's, 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 yeah, I've never heard that. I've never heard right. that word. Huh. And, and um, in terms of kind of where you're at with it, would you say... 100%, 90%, 80% over target, or can deal with target panic? Yeah. I, I haven't had target panic so bad that I haven't been able to get over it yet. I would imagine the day that that happens is the day I hang up the shoes and I'm done. But for now, I'm feeling really comfortable with my aiming, my execution, and, and my results, I think, are starting to show that. I, I feel like in the last three or four months, I've been really consistent, and I'm, I'm excited for this outdoor season. Yeah, let's talk about some results. You um, you went to Medellin uh, two, was that two weeks ago, one week right. ago? Just... Yes, <laughs> not long ago. <laughs> um, and you qualified all right, um, and you came up against Matt Sullivan, who yes. qualified second in the third round or the fourth round, I can't remember. Uh, we shot in the second round. Second round. And um, you both shot a 150. Right, right. And then it was a 10. A 10 to an X in the yeah. shoot-off. That's a tough way to beat your teammate. Yeah, I, I feel like Matt and I have shot against each other probably seven or eight times now between trials and matches. And he basically always got in the upper hand. I was probably like a 20% win rate, win rate against him. So I knew it was going to be a tough match for me going into it. Uh, just... He's a heck of a shooter, and he always seems to bring his A game in matches. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I'd need a good score, and you know, he'd come off at 149. I'd shot a little less in my first match, but um, the first end was 30-30, second end 30-30, third end 30-30. And I was like, all right, this is going to go the distance. And I, and I knew that what I needed to do to get the job done. And he shot his last arrow before me, so it was kind of like look in the scope, alright, yeah, he's got the 150 now my turn, mm -hmm. and uh, luckily, I, well not luckily, I, I was able to stay mentally composed and make the shots that I needed to to, to take the take the win mm -hmm. um, How was he about it? He was uh, I'm sure that he was angry, but he didn't let it show in the moment, he was you know, a, a consummate prof professional in that moment, uh, it's one thing to get beat in that situation, it's another to lose it, I would imagine he would have been a lot more upset had the match been like a tie at 143 or 144 something like that but when you go out and you do your best and you get beat i think it's easier to swallow than than losing at something sub sub stellar okay fair enough um you carried on you made the final against mike yep um it, it looked like a good match and then but well, we've got we've got some clips your your first arrow went high high nine yes yeah. i 
I had been struggling earlier in the day, early, early the day before, with some dips in my sight picture. And I've been playing with the, with the balance of my stabilizers, but it was still happening, so I decided to put a half turn into my tiller. And the aiming settled, everything felt wonderful, practice was going great, and as soon as I shot that arrow and it went high, well, I noticed a few ends before in practice when I was starting to get a little nerved up for the match that I kept getting these mystery high arrows. I had put my bow out of timing, and I feel like when I pulled a little harder into the wall, there was a little imbalance in the cable pressures, and I was getting that high arrow. It was a total rookie mistake. I, I should have made some adjustments to my cables in the moment when I when I had made that adjustment, but it's fixed now and everything is in timing. And I had really great, uh, really great performance in Reading last week. I shot the best that I've ever shot on that course, so I'm feeling really confident going into this. The mystery arrows are gone. I'm feeling pretty good. So how how, how did you feel when when that first one went high? I, I assume you kind of immediately it was like, oh crap. I I had never felt so calm and focused in a match as that going into that because I, because I knew Mike and I were going to have a great battle yeah. or I was hoping we would and I just I was prepared to go the distance I he he seemed a lot calmer than he has in matches and I knew that he wasn't going to just give it away like he has in past uh, he he looked like he was you know focused and ready to go so I knew that I needed to bring my A game and I was prepared to do it and I just it stunk when I was getting impacts that weren't me mm. I I I think you mentioned that you saw one bad arrow in the match for me. One to the right. One yeah. to the right, and that was, you know, that was, that one was on me. Yeah. But the rest, I feel like I just, I, I made a dumb decision, and it cost me. But that said, uh, I'm excited to get back in that situation and put things right. Okay, yeah, well, silver medal, uh, World Cup. It's not that bad, you know. It's another, right, exactly. Another one. It's, another it's, one. Yeah, it's another medal to the count. Uh, but um, yeah, I just, it, it stinks whenever you get that close and don't take the win. Uh, of course, what it does mean is you didn't get that automatic ticket to the World Cup final. Yes. Um, now that this means more winning, um, right. where does that come in? When you lose the match or when you think about it? And you're, yeah, in, in the past, whenever you got first or second, you knew that you were kind of guaranteed to go to the final mm -hmm. because you had so many points and, and the points are so coveted. But now they're even more coveted. Uh, second place is great. It doesn't automatically qualify you, but it puts you in a really good position. There's only one guy who's ahead of you and he's already automatically in. So as long as I can finish the season with, you know, relatively good successes to stay in the top eight, I should be going to the World Cup final at the end of the year. So, yeah, of course you want the win, you want the automatic bid, but I feel like I'm in great shape, and especially with the way that I'm shooting right now, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to get the job done. Let's just talk about Mikey in that final. Um, sure. 14 tens in a row, and then the last one, he put it out left. Right. Uh, kind of sad for him, he didn't get the 150 on the field. Yeah, yeah. as a competitor, I'm kind of glad he didn't. I feel like Mike with confidence is a really dangerous thing. As a friend, I'm like you said, I'm sad to see that he didn't get it. Uh, I feel like he's he's definitely had some demons in his finals matches, whether it's the timing or just you know the pressure of being uh, on TV or, or whatever it is. It's definitely gotten the best of him in the past. He's he's flirted with success. He's had a few wins out there. He's had a few wins in matches where he probably shouldn't have, but things have worked out in his favor sometimes too. He's a heck of a competitor. Uh, He's, you know, he's world number one for a reason. But um, I, I'm excited to put the pressure on him the next time we face off and, and see how things shake down. Absolutely. Um, the next time you face down might be might be in Antalya, might be in the Worlds, back in uh, in the Netherlands, in Mikey's right. home soil. Um, who would you say at this early point in the season is looking like a, a serious contender for the world world title if we're not talking about yourself? Right, obviously, Mike. He's you know he's going to be in his home course, uh, home home arena. It's it's going to be tough to go into the Netherlands and beat him. Mm. Uh, Mike's probably odds-on favorite to win. Stefan Hansen's shooting amazing, like always. Uh, we've got a young shooter, Jimmy Lutz. This, this will be his first time at the World Championships, first time you know qualifying for World Cups and everything. That's a U.S. guy. Yeah. U.S. guy. He's shooting amazing right now. He okay. took me down to the last match at our trials, 400 arrows, and we were tied. Wow. Uh, Points-wise, going into it, he's coming on strong. I. He's more of a command shooter than anything else, uh, but right now he's definitely riding the hot hand, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him go deep in the event. I, I mean, um, World Championships, often there's a, a surprise winner, not sure. always in all the divisions, but uh, we've had the last couple, I would say, some more expected compound men's winners. Right, I think, I think that's just a testament to us all uh, being in the prime of our careers and having confidence and, and just getting the job done and executing. I, 
it's not surprising to see a big name take down the world championship event, especially because, like you said, the prestige and everything, it's, it can be stressful. Mm -hmm. And picking a, a reliable a shooter is always a good way to go. <laughs> um, you, so you've, you've seen the, the kind of scene change over the years you've been doing. What, your first world just a three or no, no? Yeah, 2003, New York City. Yeah, um, you, you've kind of seen the scene and the personnel on the scene change over the 16 years since then. Right. Um, you know, it, if you had um, a group of the the best from all of those years, who would you who would you put among them? Oh my gosh, Rio Wilds. You can't. He's he's been he's a staple of American archery of, of you know worldwide archery. He's he's incredible. Jesse Broadwater. Uh, he's had his moments where he's been un, absolutely unbeatable. Mm -hmm. Dave Cousins in his prime was you know he was probably the first rock star of archery. Mm -hmm. um, those guys were probably the three best that I would pick from from the states. Uh, Peter Elzing has been there forever. Martin Damsbo, mm. uh, Morton Bow from Norway. He was incredible. Had some success in Vegas. Uh, Morgan he was, London. He was the first, obviously, to win the uh, indoor, outdoor, and and uh, not Morton Bow. That's um, Morgan London. Morgan London. I always Sweden. Get those uh, Sweden. Yeah, he was. I mean, it's it's hard. There's so many amazing shooters that have been through the years and. To be one of the last remaining guys out there, it's crazy. Like when I remember in 2003, I was 16, I was the young guy on the block, and now to be the old man on the teams is kind of weird. You got gray hair in your beard. I know, right? Yeah. I like to say that that was just archery taking my soul. Nothing with dying thing. At this point, everybody knows it, and I, if I did it, you'd all know. So I, I can't, I can't just hide it. I'd really like you to do it. All right. I think black, 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 just. Black. Okay, like a Leonidas beard. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll work on it. And then the Leonidas body comes later. <laughs> right. I'll just, yeah. After a few more off seasons, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not just the World Championships you're going to go to this year. You're going to head to the, the Pan American Games. Yes, in Lima. I'm. I'm very excited for that. It's the first time archery will be in the Pan American Games, and I feel like that's like one of the last strongholds against compound being the Olympics. So to have a good result there and and you know ex display archery in a really good light and and how exciting it can be for the viewers, I, I really I really hope to give a really good taste into the Olympic Committee uh, and show them what compound archery can be. Right, especially since the, the Olympics is headed to the US, it's a long way off. Mm -hmm. uh, how many years are we? Nine, nine years out of the LA 2028 okay. Olympics. Yep. Will you be around then? I'm going to be 42. Uh, that's a long way out to You'll see. Even more gray hairs in your Oh you know, gosh, I'll be... My, my dad was completely gray at like 26, so I feel like I'm still holding on strong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a long way off. I, even if I happen to be retired at 42, I would imagine I'll come out of it to uh, if, if to make a run. Yeah. <laughs> um, Peru, have you looked much at uh, what's in Peru, what's on offer? I, I don't know how many opportunities I'm going to have to get away from the Olympic Village, mm -hmm. but like, like you, we talked about it earlier, Machu Picchu would be amazing for a day if we had it. But like, I just the competition is going to be four or five days. I, I don't know how many opportunities I'll have to get out, but. Oh, it would be exciting. I'm excited to try per Peruvian food and, and ceviche. Kind of ceviche, yeah. Absolutely love ceviche. All right. It's good for the diet as well. Although Perfect. Not if you take too many pisco sours with it. Um, the um, obviously being in a, an American event, you haven't got the guys from Europe that have been doing so well recently. <laughs> you haven't got Koreans or anyone like that. But that doesn't mean it's going to be particularly easy. And, and one right. person I think who's got a good chance as well there is is from El Salvador, mm -hmm. of Roberto. Roberto. Roberto is, he is, when he's on, he is such a, like a streaky, amazing shooter. Yeah. I think yesterday in qualification, he shot a 359 second half, yeah. like, and the one he missed was just out. I remember going to the last night, he was clean. I looked down, I just assumed it was a 60 because I saw a wad, but he, he can shoot, like you said, he, he's going to be tough. Who else is there that you think might have? Uh... I, I honestly, I haven't looked at the list to see who's qualified and the, the, the countries are, you know, limited to one athlete per country, so... I would imagine any country that sends their best shooter is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to keep my head down, shoot my best arrows that I can, and hopefully things work out for the best. But you have to, you have to, uh, you have to think that you're, uh, you're one of the favorites there. Yeah. I know that any time I go into an event feeling confident and shooting my best that I'm a favorite to win. Mm -hmm. I've definitely gotten comfortable with that over time in my career. So knowing that, it doesn't really change my approach at, at all. I just need to go in making the best shots that I can to stay focused on, on what I need to do. You know, you said you won't have much time to leave the village. Um, one thing that I, you know, I find, well, I love history. I love history. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love seeing stuff. And I, I kind of feel a bit sad sometimes for you guys because you do a lot of archery, you do a lot of practice, right. you do a lot. You don't get to see so much around the, around the area sometimes. Is there anywhere in Shanghai you've been that you particularly like? 
Uh, not in Shanghai, but I can tell you Rome has been amazing. Yeah. Uh, I stayed a few extra days after the World Cup final, and to see the city, to see all of the history there was incredible. Growing up in the States, like our history, you're hard-pressed to find something back before the 1700s. And to go somewhere where you know, people have trampled and, and civilized every inch of that city time and time again, and like to just sit in the amphitheater or you know in the Roman Forum and just take it in like it, it's mind blowing. I I absolutely love that city. Do you know do you know where it's got some amazing history? Where Antalya. Antalya. You take a taxi forty minutes away mm -hmm. and just get them to drop you off on the side of this this hill. You walk up the hill for about thirty minutes yep. and then you come into this like phenomenal ruined Greek city. Really? Yeah, ancient Greek city. And on the top of the kind of small mountain, there's an amphitheater. Yep. It's on the very peak. So like behind it is nothing. It is oh my gosh. the best thing. Like it's my favorite thing about Antalya. Yeah. And I, I don't think anybody knows about it. No, I'm going to have to go check it out. That's incredible. It's Whenever whenever I'm in a place like that, I like to sit there and, and try to just imagine what it was like in its prime. Mm -hmm. And like, obviously with, with videos that we have from like, like you said, 300 and stuff, yeah. you kind of know, you kind of, we kind of have like the, uh, the beauty, uh, beauty yeah, whatever the pretty eye the, of it, the yeah. pretty eye of it and, and what the costumes were like or you know the times and obviously everyone spoke English and spoke with a British accent but <laughs> no um, obviously right so yeah. it's, it's cool to like look at it and kind of imagine the hustle and bustle and the excitement and everything and just know that somebody was there in that moment thousands of years you know thousand years ago mm -hmm. it's it's mind-blowing and, and then like having the archery archery stuff in some of these places I, mm -hmm. I find quite phenomenal that you know the designs. Are, yeah, okay, compound. You've got the you've got the cams and stuff. But in essence, it's, it's the still same archery. Thing. Yeah. yeah, crazy. We're playing the same sport. Yeah, just equally as frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they got annoyed? Do you think they got target panic? <laughs> I would imagine so. Like whenever I shoot Reeker with the fingers, fingers without a clicker, Oof. yeah, it's there. And I don't. I can't imagine they had clickers back in the day, do they? No, I, I doubt it. How often did you, how often did you do that? I, I shot Reeker uh, for three months in college, and I picked it up for ten days before our 2012 Olympic trials. Yeah. Yep. How did that go? Uh, I finished about mid pack with the Reeker uh, for the trials. Mm -hmm. um, indoors during college it was three months. I it was pretty awesome by the time I quit. When, when you when you're done, will you pick up a Reeker? Again? No. When I'm done with archery, I'll be done with archery. Yeah. I might I might pick up a bow to go hunting here or there with family, but yeah, when I'm done, I'm done. No more competing. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so, we're in well, on Wednesday here in Shanghai. Um, you're not shooting today. Right, I've got the day off. Because you qualified high enough? Yes. Um, tomorrow, what's on the agenda? Uh, start off in the 116th and hopefully roll through into the semifinals. Who, who's your first opponent? Uh, Tate Morgan from the US. Uh, you told me that earlier. Yes. Uh, what's Tate like? Uh, Tate is a young fearless shooter from the states uh he shoots a back tension release and he's aggressive he's gonna be a difficult match he uh he's still young so his the variance between his you know good scores and bad scores is still fairly large uh, when he's when he's on his game and shooting well he's as good as anyone in the world so it's gonna be a battle i'm sure he was in reading as well right yes he was so he came the same time as you yeah we, we all sat in the same row uh, him myself and tanya and trapped together and great friend Cool. Um, the team event? You're in the team event as well? Yes, it'll be myself, Matt Sullivan, and Chris Schaff. And then for the World Championships, it's Chris Schaff, myself, and Jimmy Lutz. That's the new guy. That's the new guy. Yeah. Um, some teams kind of already pick their pick their squad so they get a couple of competitions to practice mm -hmm. together. Right. Uh, different for the US, you've got two events yeah, as a World we, Cup team. Um, we didn't finish picking our team until about three weeks ago so it was impossible to book flights and everything mm. get everything set up so uh, we will all be competing as a team together in Turkey okay that's a, it's good to have at least one practice before. exactly get get used to every each other in the team round and just kind of get comfortable with uh, rooming together and learning each other's habits so we're not figuring it out at the world championships uh, well I think the US has won maybe over 50% of all of the, the compound men's golds in the world mm -hmm. is the reigning the reigning champion again yes now? we won in Mexico City um, it's important Yes, of course. Uh, I feel like compound in America has been like a stronghold. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, growing up, I I learned that from the older guys. Like mm -hmm. that was, you know, that was the one thing. We may not win individually, but we were going to win as a team. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I try to impart on the guys that are here now. Like we we've always historically been the best team, uh, you know, over time. And I, I really want to maintain that while I'm still competing. So I I really Netherlands is going to be tough. 
Denmark's always tough. Like, there's a bunch of countries that are Korea is, is you know, difficult. Uh, we're going to have to bring our A game, but I want to see us get it done. That would be mean a lot. Remember here last year, you shot a good match, didn't you? Uh, the team. Yes. I, I it was down to Korea. Korea and I going to last night, we shot a 60 to close, I, but I honestly couldn't tell you how it ended. I don't remember. We won. We won? Awesome. <laughs> Great. Uh, there's... They all melt. They all mold together at this point. It's just how many medals have you had on the World Cup circuit, man? Dude, I, I didn't count that. I saw, saw the article where it was like a lot, a lot. Yeah. I want or low sixties. I think it's. I think it's. I think you might have hit seventy now. Okay. How about that? <laughs> well done, well I never done. would have imagined that in two thousand three when I got started. No. no. How, how far did you think you'd go? Uh, at that point, I hadn't even gone to college yet, so I, I knew that I would shoot through college and. When I got out, I had had enough success that it was like, you know, let, let's just try this for a couple of years and see if I can do it as a full-time job. And luckily, I, things worked out for me, and I, I was able to, you know, win a few events and and settle in with a company that took care of me and, and allowed me to continue competing. And now it's just it's become my job, my life, and it's kind of a roller coaster you can't get off. At times, it can be the most exhilarating thing in the world. Like when you're winning events and you feel like you're unstoppable, it's amazing. This, this is world championship number nine or number uh, indoor and outdoor it's probably outdoor, more than outdoor, outdoor yeah everything since two, 2003 I've been on every team it's quite a cool record yeah it's, I wonder I wonder how many I'm sure there's some recurve shooters who have been to millions but um, yeah we'll have to look that up and see but yeah it's uh, I, I love representing my country at world championships it means so much to, to you know have the stars and strike on my sleeve and, and go out there and just know that I'm doing it not just for myself like at a lot of the events in the U.S. or you know the companies that I represent but also to be representing the U.S. it's it's very meaningful. Well and you'll be back there in just a couple of months the world championships in Den Bosch take place in June uh, that was us the live from, uh, from live delayed live from Shanghai uh, I was Chris we're here with Braden say goodbye Braden thank, thank you, you so much, very guys. much for, um, for joining us uh, stay tuned for the rest of the competition we've got finals on Saturday and Sunday and then we'll be moving on to Antalya for stage three in two weeks' time. Okay. See you.